I now look to the former chair of DSC, Lewis Yu, to close the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, everyone. You know, it's good to be back speaking here 10 years on. Uh, I know I look quite youthful. Cocoa butter, if you want to ask. Um, <laughs> things are different here uh, since I was last in town. Uh, as you know, I was Aozu president. You may know, you may not know, I couldn't blame you. Uh, I was president of Aozu. Uh, today, you elect your Aozu president using a fancy electronic online voting system. Back then, we used pen and paper and ballot boxes, making it much more difficult now to rig elections. Some may say, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> safe spaces is now a thing. Um, so you're trying to pull down a statue of a racist, where back then we invited racists to take part in debates like this one. Uh, Sore point, I know. Something like um, and the world has changed. So for example, if you're today a, a student who wants to see a great piece of art or theatre full of diverse people, diverse cast members. You can sort of watch Hamilton, an amazing piece of, piece of theatre, or, or watch Black Panther. Uh, when I was a student, back in 2008, the best we had was Big Mama's House too. Um, and that tells you that times have changed, things have moved on here, and that's a good thing. But some things will always be the same, and people will still have the same views about Oxbridge divisive views about Oxbridge. And you know what, I'm still very wary of that. Um, for many years, I've used the same barber for 25 years, and I didn't tell him at all that I had been accepted to Oxford, and I went to Oxford and left Oxford, until he saw a newspaper article which referenced the fact that I was at, I was at Oxford. And he asked me, he was like, Lewis, you didn't tell me you were at Oxford. Uh, and I didn't. I mean, what is he going to do? Cut my head differently? Give me a different type of fade? <laughs> I, I don't, of course I'm not going to tell you. Uh, I concealed it from people because it was, you know, it was very divisive. And that's a shame. And I think a lot of this debate has been sort of a list of things which Oxford could do better. And I want to look at three things in this debate. First of all, I want to look at failure and actually examine what we mean by failure. Because I think this side haven't actually given you a definition of failure which I think is sufficient. Second of all, I want to sort of look at the system and look at the context that we've put this debate in and tell you why in order to have failure you need to look at the system. And finally I want to look at the positive force that Oxford is uh, in terms of the social entrepreneurs it creates and in terms of the research it produces. Let's look at failure. Because if this debate was this house believes Oxford could do more or this house believes Oxford could be more diverse, that would be a pretty truistic debate. It would be pretty boring. I mean, you're better off watching Infinity War or Arsenal. Maybe not Arsenal, but the, the, point, the point is, the point is, this debate is deeper than that. This debate implies there is a moral judgment we're making about this institution, that there is an agency, a level of control, a level of, 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 of sort of understanding that you can pull all these different wheels together that Oxford clearly doesn't have. And that's why the system is incredibly important. And let's look at the system. We told you that the system is broken. These guys said, yeah, the system's broken, but actually Oxford should be able to fix it. Well, no. If you have a government that has underfunded education systematically since they took over, where they scrapped the child poverty target for 2020, where they removed funding for Sure Start, where they've gutted the funding for mental health services in schools, where they've deprived funding for interventions, no thank you, that would actually help improve the confidence of young disadvantaged people, of course, that's going to hurt the pipeline later down the line. Of course that's going to happen. Let's look at employers. There's a lot of chat about employers, about barristers, about politicians, about law firms, about the corporate world. Oxford doesn't have any control over them, right? Oxford has actually moved on quite progressively in terms of how it interviews candidates, how it makes interviews progressive. It already uses contextualized data in admissions, guys. But the corporate world hasn't. So if the corporate world are still behind, but Oxford have actually moved on, I'm sorry, but you can't blame Oxford for the fact that employers still see Oxbridge as a mark of excellence. That's their problem. That's the system's problem. That's not Oxbridge's problem. Of course Oxford has got more to do. But this debate is about agency and control over a system that is deeply flawed. A system that still sees disadvantaged kids three times more likely to be excluded from school 
than kids from wealthier backgrounds. And that system is the system that we want to change. But you don't get there by focusing, and I think the point made by the floor is a good one, by focusing on two universities, Mr. Speaker, when the entire system needs to be reformed. And that's a key point which I think they've missed. Let's look at the second issue of social entrepreneurship. Because I, uh, my tutor once said to me, Lewis, you know, um, you're an okay student, but let's face it, you're an arrogant little shit. Um, <laughs> And that's because this university inculcates a sense of leadership, a sense that you could change the world. We all run around pretending we're mini politicians or actors or news editors of the Churl or the Oxjew, thinking that we can have big control over our world and that we can change it. And we leave this institution and we then do it. And we use the networks that we have, we use the education we have. And do you know what? Oxford, more than most universities, actually produces people who have a social conscience. There's a sense of guilt. I have a sense of guilt that I've got this education. I think that's why so many Oxbridge graduates go and work for your charity, Russell. <laughs> the shoe fits, wear it. And I think, to be honest, that's why so many Oxbridge graduates go up to set up important social enterprises. I can name a few of them. Bridge uh, the, the, the Bridge Group, The Bait Mate, Brightside, Inter University, The Access Project, Future First, Right to Succeed, all led by Oxbridge graduates. And they're doing incredible work behind the scenes. It's not glamorous. You may not hear about it. But they're trying to close the education gap. I think that's important. The final point I want to make, and that's important. So, you know, I've argued that we actually produce a lot of people who go out and change the world and actually help to close those systematic problems. Again, a point that's being ignored. But a point that's also been ignored is the research, the huge amount of research that you get from an institution that has money and is elitist to some extent, right? Let's look at some of the research. Research into obesity and our understanding of obesity has come primarily from the two leading universities we're talking about in today's debate. If you look at vaccination and the World Health, World Health, Health Organization's new guidelines on the best way to vaccinate people across, across the developing world, that piece of research was informed by research done in the two universities here, at, well, the two universities we're talking about, Oxford and Cambridge. We've had some really important testimony about the mental health of students at this university. I think that's incredibly important to hear. And Oxford could obviously do more. But let's remember, and let's take it in the round. This is the university at Oxford, which has the Center for Suicide Research, the Center for Research on Eating Disorders, and has elite, ladies and gentlemen, research and money pumped into helping the world's understanding of those disorders, producing world-class research to inform policy. Right? Of course, on the margins, there are going to be really difficult cases. This university has not been good to students in terms of the mental health. And I was, I was someone who criticised the university openly when I was president of ALSI. But we have to take things holistically. This is a university that produces research that changes people's lives, not just in the UK, but abroad. So when you're thinking about this debate, this debate is not a basic, is Oxbridge good or not? It's much deeper than that. It's how much control does Oxford have on a system that is fundamentally flawed? It produces people who try to change that system every day, and for its world-leading research, actually makes a difference to people's lives. You get that where you attract the best researchers, where you have the money, and where you have the history to do so. It's for all those reasons I'm proud to stand on this side of the house. Thank you.